crime, conspiracy, cults, and murder. All things that I love to consume uh, <laughs> on a regular basis. And things of which I like to talk about with you because I find them fascinating and I know you do too because you're watching me. And today I thought we'd delve into something I have not talked about yet on this channel and that is a couple serial killers. Not a couple serial killers. Serial killers who are a couple. Specifically Fred and Rose West. Names synonymous with horror, depravity, and unspeakable acts. This was a married couple that collectively murdered up to 30 young women over the span of two decades. Together they would build a torture dungeon in their home at 25 Cromwell Street in the small English town of Gloucester. Sorry if I said that wrong. And it is there that they would murder runaways, hitchhikers, and even family as a part of their regular sexual life. Treating these strangers as nothing more than trash. And it is at this address where they would dispose of the girls as well. In this video, we will delve into the chilling chronicles of their lives from their births to their eventual demise. So let's unbuckle our seatbelts, go Mach 5 down the highway, slam on the brakes and dive through this windshield into this match made in hell together. Thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video. For those of you who are living under a rock and don't know, Audible is the world's leader in audio entertainment, audiobooks, podcasts, and Audible originals. It is the destination for storytelling that excites and transports listeners over the course of their daily lives. I know for me, I am constantly on the go. And I know I struggle with just sitting down and reading something. It takes a lot for me to do that. So Audible has been huge while doing other things that I want to get done, whether it's cleaning the house or going for a walk or traveling in a car because I cannot read a book in a car, I will vomit. And I have been using Audible for years. So I was super excited when they reached out to work with me. And I'm a huge horror and true crime fan. As you guys know, I just listened to it. And if you guys have seen the movie, it doesn't do the book justice. I would highly recommend listening to that. It's terrifying and awesome. And I have a couple other thrillers that are lined up for me to listen to, including The Coldest Case by James Patterson, another one of my favorite authors and Good Half Gone by Taryn Fisher. I also really enjoy listening to autobiographies as well. I've listened to Robin Williams and Matthew Perry's and they are outstanding. I highly recommend those as well, especially with Matthew Perry's. It's so cool that you could actually hear his voice. It just makes it that much more special. And with the true crime stuff, I find that the narration really helps you get immersed into the experience and makes it that much cooler. And new members can get a free trial on Audible. Members also get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. You can download included titles all you want, which is awesome. And one of the things I love the most is that Audible has a must-hear collection of the latest and greatest the thriller genre has to offer. And they have everything from action thriller to psychological thrillers, essentially anything thriller you can imagine it's there and it's awesome. But besides thrillers, Audible has literally everything to offer from bestsellers to new releases to celebrity memoirs, like I mentioned, mysteries, motivation, and wellness, which I also enjoy. I highly recommend listening to The Antidote and 4,000 Weeks. That's one of my top picks as well. And the Audible app makes it super easy to anytime, anywhere. So if you want to deep dive into some cool, mysterious thrillers, click the link in the description and download Audible today and start your free trial now. Thank you again to Audible for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. Also, I know I am not in my regular space. I am in Texas and I do look like I am Oompaville, but I'm not. I am just in his space using his stuff because I don't have mine yet. So we're just gonna, we're gonna have this, this uh, questionable background for today. So let's start with Fred West. Fred was born on September 29th, 1941 in a rural town of Muckmarkle, England. Again, sorry if I said that wrong. To a very, very poor family. His parents were named Walter and Daisy West. And although those names sound very pleasant, they were in fact the exact opposite. Not only were they hideous on the inside, they were hideous on the outside as well. Being called literal ogres by people that knew them. And don't take my word for it. Look at them for yourself. I can only make fun of them because 
because I know they're literal pieces of shit. So Fred would be the firstborn of five children, one of which was a raging psychopath just like Fred, and his name was John West. He was later found to be a possible accomplice to Fred and Rose West later on for the grapes and murders committed against Fred and Rose's victims, but that's actually very new information, so we don't have a lot on that right now. So for now, we're gonna focus on Fred. So Fred's family was the epitome of poverty, turmoil, and mistreatment. If you were to know nothing about his crimes as an adult and just heard about his childhood, you could guess pretty quick that this kid was gonna grow up pretty f***ed up and into some weird ass shit. Not that there's anything wrong with growing up poor. I think a lot of us did and turned out not to, you know, murder everyone we know. But when it's coupled with and brainwashing and severe head trauma, it might lead to a different story like it did for Fred. Not making excuses for him, by the way, I hate this man with all of my being, but I think the history of these people becoming who they are is extremely interesting. So like I said, Fred's parents were far from well off and were even further from being sane. But before anything crazy, happened to Fred. He was known to be a very boring and dull child and would routinely get bullied and beat up by his peers in school, along with his teachers, you know, back in the good old days when your teachers beat you for not writing a cursive word correctly. So because he got beat up so much in school, his mother would often step in and come to his aid and he would become quite the mommy's boy. And this was more true than anyone could imagine because when he turned 12 years old, Daisy West began having sexual inter you know what with her oldest son, Fred, AKA mommy's boy. And this was normal for them. Obviously Fred didn't know any better because he was a literal child at the time, but it was not incredibly unusual for the time for this to be taking place um, in families in this area specifically as well. Don't get me wrong, most people did find this appalling and it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily normal or that everybody did it, but there was more families than you would like to believe that practiced this stuff. More so between cousins doing the dirty with each other, not necessarily, you know, mothers and sons, but it still flew under the radar amongst a lot of people. Fred's father, on the other hand, told and encouraged Fred to use and other children. He said that it was just the natural thing to do. And Fred would internalize this to the fullest extent and terrorize other kids in the neighborhood as much as he could. Even after he was caught and scolded about assaulting multiple girls in the community, he was bewildered by the fact that anyone really cared. Him saying that, well, everyone did it, so why can I do it? That's kind of what he sounded. That's not exactly what he sounded like. That's what it, that's what he's going to sound like in this video, right? As a 12 year old. <laughs> so you'll start to see how Fred's family basically groomed him to believe anyone besides yourself is disposable playthings that you can use and throw out anytime with zero repercussions. Now by 15, Fred left school barely able to read or write above a second grade level. And although dumb and cruel, people did think he was one of the best looking teens in town. What the f And for the most part, besides occasionally trying to be a creep and girls and bullying other kids, he was probably going to stay a pretty mild criminal like his father, according to professionals that psyche valed him later in life and wouldn't become the sadistic murderer he was come to be known as. But what is assumed to have sparked those murderous, psychopathic, sadistic tendencies was an event that happened when he was 17 years old. One day he was riding his motorcycle while a girl was riding her bicycle in the opposite direction toward him. And Fred, being the little that he was, tried to intentionally run her over, but in doing so, he crashed his bike and flew over the handlebars, landing right on top of his head, putting him into a seven day coma. Or should I say seven day karma? Am I right? Anyway, and that injury to his frontal cortex alone would have probably put him right in with plenty of other serial killers, up brain chemistries, but this dumb little bastard ended up hitting his head again shortly after the first time he did. And this happened when he was trying to grab a girl on a balcony inappropriately. Shocking. Classic Fred. But she ended up punching him in the face and he ended up falling off the two-story building and landing on his head, losing consciousness again. So having two severe concussions back to back at the time. At this point, I think there was some higher power trying to get rid of Fred West but this mother was gifted with the nine lives of a cat at birth. So I digress. So when Fred 
recovered from these injuries, everyone around him said that he changed for the worst, being more short-tempered and violent than before. And this is a very common thing among serial killers. For those of you who don't know, frontal lobe injuries in the early years of serial killers are said to be one of the causes of later crimes due to the reduction of size and activity in their prefrontal cortex. This is the area of the brain that's responsible for decision making, impulse control, and empathy. And neurologists have studied at length that individuals who have undergone damage to their ventromedial frontal cortex and who had normal personalities before the damage developed abnormal social conduct leading to negative personal consequences. And although this is true for some serial killers, brain damage cannot be the motivator for serial killing alone. In fact, 46% of all confessed serial killers have no frontal damage or any brain damage at all. The majority admits that they were perfectly aware of the acts that they were doing before, during, and after committing the crimes. It's often a mixture of nature and nurture, but when both those aspects of their life are negative and you throw in a little frontal lobe injury, it's a recipe for disaster. Anyway, neurological lesson over. Let's get back to it. Now, after Fred sustained his head injuries, he started to go off the rails. When he was 19, he began having a relationship with a 13-year-old girl. That's a crime. And proceeded to also get her pregnant. That's also a crime. It's a two for one. And he would be arrested for this initially, saying that it was having unlawful carnal knowledge of a child whatever that means. So after his charges in trial, Fred would quickly become known as the town brain damaged violent child thief. And with this astounding reputation, believe it or not, he couldn't get a job. So he would move to another town called Ledbury and would do odd manual labor jobs in construction mostly. And this would be the job he'd do for the most part in and during his adult life. And these would be the skills he'd use in building the torture chamber that came to be in his family home in the years to come as well. So Fred now working and stealing in Ledbury. He was also a kleptomaniac. Can you believe it? He had an ex-girlfriend friend named Rena Costello return home from traveling. They had dated previously years before for a short period of time, and then she had left, and then she had traveled back, and they hit it off again. And also, she was pregnant with a Glasgow bus driver's child. And after finding out the child would be mixed race, Fred took it upon himself to offer slash convince to abort the child for her in the woods. What a gentleman. But luckily, while he was performing the abortion in the woods, they would get caught by somebody and be forced to stop and Fred would then agree to raise the child instead of trying to abort it. What a swell guy. So in 1962, Fred and Rena would get married. And can you believe it? The guy that wanted to rip out a child from the woman's body wasn't the best husband. Immediately after they got married, Fred treated Rena like a sexual object and nothing else, demanding it constantly and treating her like she was less than human, which you'll find a major pattern in with Fred's MO. And this next part probably seems like it's not important to the rest of this story, but Fred was a constant premature ejaculator. I'm sorry. And when I say premature, I mean literal seconds. He was known as the one pump and dump on the streets and in the sheets if you're picking up what I'm laying down. He wasn't actually known as that, I just wanted to say that. So life was shitty for everyone involved at this point, mostly being Rena. But things would get substantially worse when Rena gave birth to that other man's mixed child in March of 1963 and the baby ended up being a girl and they named her Charmaine. Now Fred was too embarrassed to have a mixed race baby so he would convince everybody in their neighborhood that Rena's child was a stillborn and that they got Charmaine in replacement of the stillborn so it, it wasn't his kid which it wasn't in the first place he just didn't want to be associated with having a wife that had another man's child basically. But Fred would still hate the child and end up leaving Rena for a new life in Glasgow anyway. So none of it really mattered. And in Glasgow, he would somehow manage to become an even creepier piece of shit, driving around an ice cream truck van as a new job. <laughs> Just, it's, he's just a stereotype at this point. It's like a movie was, this is like a true horror movie, truly. And we're not even, we're not even scraping the surface yet. Just hold tight. And with this truck, he tried to pick up teenage girls to get with in the truck. And it is unconfirmed how many girls he got successfully into the truck. And it's unknown how many he 
but we know that once he did get them into the truck, he most likely dismembered and murdered them from crimes we will see in the future. After Fred would get arrested for his crimes with Rose later in the future, police would trace him back to living in Glasgow at the same time four young girls fitting Fred's victim type went missing without a trace. So we can comfortably assume that he was responsible for that, but we don't know for sure. They would also find out that he had a garden plot in the community garden that he would demand be kept clear from everybody in the community for something special. That's something special, most likely being the girls that he murdered. And we also can assume that because that's how he disposed of bodies in the future when he murdered girls with Rose West as well. And by the time police would find Fred's first victim, they could clearly see that he had murdered before. So they can safely assume that he had murdered girls in Glasgow as well. But they couldn't check this because by the time they learned about these murders and about the garden that was in Glasgow, there was 13 lanes of traffic built over top of the garden. So we'll never know for sure. Now, unfortunately, Rena would eventually join Fred again in Scotland and shortly after that become pregnant with Fred's first child. And she would give birth to another girl named Anne Marie. This guy was getting bitches pregnant left and right, by the way. You'll see in the story. I, 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 I can't even remember how many kids he has. At least 10, eight, I don't know. I can't remember. We'll get, we'll get to it, but it's insane. And Fred would also get two other women in Glasgow pregnant and have two sons named Stephen and Garrett. And we'll hear about these boys later in the story as well. And Rena wasn't much better. I mean, she wasn't killing people or anything, but she would go off and sleep with another bus driver. This woman had a thing for bus drivers. I don't know what to tell you. And she would temporarily leave Fred for John the bus driver. But eventually she would do what she always does and return back to her original shit-stained husband, Fred. And you're probably wondering what the hell Fred did with all these kids that were running around while he was off murdering people and trying to get people into his ice cream truck and whatnot. Well, he would just drop them off at a babysitter's. Just kidding, he dropped them off at foster care for days to weeks on end. So he would go through the trouble of putting his kids into the system so he could get his knob wet for 2.5 seconds uninterrupted, and then he'd go grab him when he felt like it. Dad of the year, truly. Rita would also hire a live-in nanny to help. And also so Fred, you know, wouldn't keep putting his kids into foster care because he was a lazy piece of shit. And this nanny was named Issa McNeil. And from what Issa claimed, Fred used to make his two daughters sleep in the bottom bunk where there was two slats that pin them into a literal frame like animals and they would only be let out when he went to work. So they were literally treated worse than dogs. And again, this, it gets just so much worse. And eventually Issa would introduce Rena to a 16 year old runaway named Anna McFall. And she would actually move into Fred and Rena's house as well. And you'll see this become a pattern and a tactic Fred and Rose would use to gather people in the future. And they would gather people like this that they liked and then eventually dispose of them. But we'll get to that. And it was also around this time that Anna moved in with Fred that Fred would accidentally run over a boy with his ice cream truck and kill him but not be charged because that was just a thing that happened enough for him to just not get charged which is crazy but after this incident he decided he wanted to go back to much more Markle, much Markle, muck Markle. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, muck Markle. Rena would follow in toll with her two kids and Issa and Anna, but they all would collectively at this point live in a caravan. So naturally things were always filthy and disgusting and tense to say the least. I couldn't even spend two hours in a van with my entire family. I can't imagine the hellhole that this caravan was. So in 1966, Fred got a job at a slaughterhouse. Yeah. But this job was to actually move product from one place to another. So he wasn't actually slaughtering anything, but he was, but he was, it just wasn't animals. And at this point he was pretty comfy moving dead bodies around, if you know what I'm saying. So while Fred was working at the slaughterhouse, Rena made a plan to go back to Glasgow to be with bus driver John again, taking the kids and the nannies with her. But Fred would come back to them packing up everything that evening and threaten to kill them if they did ditch him. So Rena being the protective, devoted mother that she was, packed up her shit and got the hell out of Dodge and just left her kids behind with a 
murdering Fred. Anyway, so Rena left with Issa, the babysitter, and the kids were left with Fred and Anna. Anna decided to stay back because she was, you know, responsible and wanted to take care of the kids because their mother just left to go bounce up and down on a bus driver's prindle. But unfortunately, this would prove to be a fatal decision for Anna. See, Anna was somehow infatuated with Fred. Uh, reasons are which unknown because I don't know. But it was most likely because she developed some sort of Stockholm syndrome with Fred, both fearing and wanting him to love her, even though he did horrible things to her. And when Rena would end up coming back to get her children after she was done, you know, bouncing up and down on the bus driver's prindle, she would find that Fred and Anna were actually together. But Fred would gather a whopping eight SA charges against other women during this two year period. So he wasn't exactly the faithful type, but I wouldn't expect anything less from, you know, a murdering asshole. And also years and years after Fred got caught, investigators would take another look at Fred's case and find that essentially everywhere he went, there was a trail of missing bodies or cold cases in his wake. So police are almost certain Fred alone killed dozens more women than we know. So in 1967, Anna fell pregnant with another one of Fred's children. Oh, and I forgot to mention she's 17. She's 17 at this point. He loves getting children pregnant, which is just terrible. And at this time, he was around 26 or 27. And speaking of crimes, Anna would up and disappear in the summer of 1967. And Fred wouldn't be asked about it really because she was a runaway, if you remember. And nobody really took notice or cared about runaways at that time. But her body would be discovered in 1994, 27 years later, in finger post field, almost surgically dismembered with the head being detached from her body along with her limbs and it was almost certainly not Fred's first kill. Fred also at some point had cut the unborn child out of Anna as well after death. Fred would confess that he would dismember their bodies because it made it easier to bury them in a more shallow grave. So he's not only a murdering piece of shit, he's also a lazy piece of shit. In murdering and then dismembering the bodies as well, he would also slice off the corpse's fingers, toes, ankles, wrists, and kneecaps, although he would claim it was to make it harder to identify the bodies for the police if they ever found them, police believe he just kept them for himself as trophies or possibly to consume. So Anna now being out of the picture and Rena growing tired of the bus driver, Rena decided to come back to Fred and start a new job, a job Fred very much encouraged her to do. And that was to be a lady of the night, if you know what I mean. Fred loved that Rena got into this kind of work. He was like a sick little 15 year old schoolboy that liked to show off his girlfriend's nudes to his friends. He just loved to show all of her off to everyone that would look basically. And it was around this time that Fred picked up a girl named Mary Bastom and he would kill her. This would be a murder that Fred would confess to, to his son, Stephen, after his arrest, but the body was never found, so he was never charged for it. Which also begs the question, how many bodies did we not know about? And it could be in the dozens. But shortly getting back with Rena, Fred somehow, being the ladies man that he is, found his one true love, his partner in crime, his match made in hell, the woman he'd create a murderous homemade dungeon with, Rose Pauline. Letts. Now, Rose Letts was born on November 29th, 1953 in Northam, Devon, England to William Letts and Daisy Fuller. Yes, Rose and Fred both had mothers named Daisy, but just like Fred's mother, Rose's mother, Daisy, was not so sweet as her name proclaimed. Rose's mother, in fact, suffered from postpartum depression after having four children, and she would go on to have seven children in total. But to cure her PPD, doctors prescribed Described her electroconvulsive therapy. Therapy so intense that teeth would literally shatter out of patients' mouths. Pretty sure that would cure you because all you could think about was the pain instead of your depression. But I digress. When Daisy was pregnant with Rose, the doctors convinced her to continue these electroconvulsive therapy sessions. So Rose was literally just being microwaved in the womb. And as a result of that, Rose's brain was essentially being fried in utero. Shout out to Nirvana. Now, did this make Rose a psychotic, narcissistic murderer that she became? 
No. But it definitely played a small part in her brain not developing to its full potential. So having a not so premium brain coupled with the fact that she lived with literal monsters helped in facilitating who she became later in life. One of the bigger factors being meeting Red. So as a child, Rose was known to have a very dull, empty, doe-eyed look at her eyes. The 30-yard stare, if you will. So her siblings would naturally make fun of her and call her Dozy Rosie, which I think is actually a cute nickname, or a terrible, terrible human being. I hate this woman more than anything. And you'll see, you'll see down the line. So Rose would naturally spend most of her time alone with her six hamsters. Who the f*** has six hamsters? I don't Whatever. But what screwed up Rose most as a child was her piece of shit father, William Letts. Now, William was a schizophrenic diagnosed at a very young age and would constantly suffer from severe psychotic episodes in front of his family and on his own. But he would just not tell him that he was schizophrenic. He just kept that to himself. So the family literally just thought he was genuinely just a psychopath because they didn't know about his condition. But diagnosis aside, Will was an absolute piece of shit, like I was saying. He would often beat his children, throwing them against walls, beating them with poles, and even pouring boiling water over their skin. Because unlike Fred's family, who were extremely filthy, Rose's dad was extremely OCD and wanted to keep everything clean at all times. So he made them do chores. If they didn't do it right, they got beat to an inch of their life or they were cleaned constantly with boiling water that would leave welts on their skin, etc. But he would not treat Rose the same way. In fact, Rose would play dumb a lot and whine and say that she doesn't want to do her chores and she would end up getting her siblings to somehow do her chores. And Will was actually very amused by that. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. It wasn't necessarily a good thing that he favored Rose because despite not getting physically beat by her father, she was allegedly a victim of SA from her father, which is terrible and I hope he is rotting in hell, but it does not remotely excuse what she did later on in life. Now, as Rose grew up, she became somewhat of a mini psychopath that lied, bullied, and became violent towards boys and girls. And she would become hypersexual as soon as she hit puberty, which is not uncommon for people that experience SA as a child. And she would even go as far as to commit essay on her own younger brothers by the time she was just 15 years old. So seeing some similarities here between Rose and Fred's upbringing, between the brain injuries, essay victim history, and essay perpetual history of them committing it against other people, you can kind of see how they were a match made in hell. So by the time Rose was 15, she was doing regular sexual work at a local bus stop. And this is when she would inevitably meet Fred, of whom was about 27 years old at this time, and she was only 15. So he's got a pattern here. And us knowing Fred now, he almost certainly sought her out as a victim of SA and most likely murder, but they would start talking and immediately hit it off because they found so many things in common, whether it be that their mothers had the same name or that they had similar family history. Rose worked at a bakery and uh, Fred had an ice cream truck, so that's that's sweet. And you know, that they're both pieces of shit, so they would, they would hit it off. But what Fred would like most about Rose is that she was just as, if not even more so, sensual than Fred. When Fred would bring up very crude and vulgar topics, Rose wouldn't flinch at all. In fact, even add on to it. So he saw the potential immediately. So Fred and Rose would hit it off and Rose would bring the 12 year older Fred back home to meet her parents. And her parents naturally hated Fred because but Rose would try to sell him off as that he was very rich and he was very successful, but the only thing he was rich and full of was shit. So after meeting Fred, Bill and Daisy would put their daughter Rose into a home for troubled teenagers because parenting in the house is too hard apparently. And they would just forget her there. Classic middle child trope. So Rose would spend months in the home until she turned 16 and 16 year olds at that point were considered adults and they wouldn't be able to be in a 
troubled teenager home anymore. But who was ready to come swoop her up off her feet? The 12 year older Fred. And shortly after picking her up, he would get Rose pregnant and they would move into a building in Gloucester at 25 Midland Road. There, Fred and Rose would live with Fred's child, Anne Marie, and Rena's child, Charmaine. So on October 1970, Rose gave birth to her first of eight children. Like God, by eight, they're probably walking out with a top hat twirling a cane. But her her firstborn was named Heather Ann. And when she was born, Fred would be back in jail for about three months because he had gone in and out of jail for very uh, minor charges. But this would be at this point the longest stint he had been in jail and it was for stealing five car tires from his place of work. So Rose being 17 years old and taking care of three children, two of which were not her own, and being a child herself, shit started to hit the fan fast at home. Rose would be seen by a child neighbor beating Charmaine with a wooden spoon as she tied Charmaine's hands up by a belt and hung her from the roof while she stood barely on a chair. And at other times, the children would show up to emergency rooms with literal stab wounds, but Rose would just explain them away somehow. Fred, on the other hand, was having a gay old time in jail, just writing dirty letters back and forth with Rose on the daily. So while Rose was beating her kids and Fred was getting off in jail, Rose took it upon herself to commit her first murder, and that murder was committed against a child. And this is what's interesting about this couple specifically. When you see other serial killer couples, usually the man is the dominant one. Um, that usually convinces the partner, their female partner, to commit the crimes. But this couple, on their own, were murderers. So, and, and in fact, Rose was the instigator in a lot of situations. So they both had committed crimes unprovoked by the other. And this is just another thing that they would see in common with each other and love each other more for. So one day, Rose took her children, Charmaine and Anne Marie, to see Fred in prison for a visit. And after their visit, we don't know why, but Rose would beat and stab Charmaine to death. And she would put her corpse in the building cellar. And wouldn't tell Fred until he was released from jail a few weeks later. And Fred, being the piece of shit he is, was completely unfazed at all that Rose had killed his daughter. In fact, he would go on to gush about some of the murders that he had committed in the past. This was essentially just a f***ed up bonding moment between two psychopaths at this time. So after Fred found out where Rose put Charmaine's body, he would cut off her fingers, toes, knees, caps, ankles, and wrists, as he did with the other victims, and he would move it into the yard and bury it near the back door, with the idea in mind of extending the house out later and layering the body with a concrete foundation, which is something that he did do shortly after. Now, not long after Fred had buried and covered up Rose's murder, Rose would leave Fred temporarily, and good old Rena, Fred's first wife, would come back into the picture trying to gain custody of her two children, Charmaine and Anne-Marie. But naturally, one was missing and that was Charmaine. So naturally, Rena was flipping out asking where her daughter was and Fred played it off saying, okay, you know, come in my car. I'll take you to where she is right now. So Rena hopped in her car and Fred immediately would kill her by shoving a length of chromium tubing down her throat. And that uh, that's just a horrendous way to go. I, I After reading that, I had to like take five minutes just to process that. This man is sick, like just a sick psychopath and I hope he's burning in hell and I just Anyway, so after he murdered her, he would dismember the body and keep his usual body parts as trophies and would bury her at Finger Post Field near the grave of Anne McFall, his previous victim. And neither Charmaine's nor Rena's disappearances would be noticed, given both their track records. And it would go unnoticed for another 13 years. So after these events, Rose would return and she would turn 18, allowing her to legally marry Fred. And that is when they would move into their infamous murder house of horrors, 25 Cromwell Street. And this would be the house that Rose and Fred would build their torture and kill dungeon that looked and became something straight out of a horror movie. So the house at 25 Cromwell Street was three stories, an attic and a cellar. And Fred and Rose would move in with their two surviving children, Anne and Heather. And right out the gate, Fred and Rose planned to expand and renovate the cellar 
to be their personal play place. But the crazy thing about the Cromwell house was that they weren't the only ones that lived there. There were other tenants that lived there as well. The Wests live on the first floor and they had the cellar and there would be tenants that took up the second and the third floors. So the Wests moved in and quickly Rose began to do sexual work again in the cellar at Fred's request because this was a win-win for both of them. Rose was a sick, psychotic, sociopathic nymphomaniac and Fred was a giant and like to watch Rose have relations with other people among many other things of which we'll talk about. So they would dub the cellar room as mom and dad's room and there would be a plaque on the wall with Rose's name on it which sounds sweet doesn't it? But no. It was just to cover up the hole that Fred would look through to watch Rose commit unspeakable acts to other men and women. But Rose was well aware of this. It just was the strangers having relations with her that weren't. Fred and Rose would also partake in threesomes pretty often because Rose claimed that she was bisexual, um, so they would often pick up these women in Gloucester and bring them back to the Cromwell house. Most of these women being runaways and drifters. And this was their pattern that they did. They would go out in a car and it was easy for Rose to lure women into the car because Fred had trouble doing that on his own. But when you have a female companion, it just seems less threatening. And we see this time and time again with couples or even with previous serial killers that I've talked about where it's a man and they get a child to help them lure etc. So they would use this tactic and it would work very well. But at this point, they're not killing anybody together. They were only using the dungeon as a sigil room, but they would evolve and, and test it out as a torture room soon after. And they would do that using their own daughter. So they would bring in Anne Marie and they would bring her down to the cellar and Rose would hold her down and Fred did the unspeakable to his own daughter. And then Fred would proceed to remove her hymen and collect it into a bowl for reasons unknown. Probably just because he was a sick f and I hope he dies in hell and rots there forever. But most people uh, and professionals assume that Fred was actually a cannibal given all the body parts that he kept and that were never found. But that was never actually proven. So that's just speculation. But I think it's pretty fair and safe to say. But the torture with Anne would not stop there. Shortly after the first incident, Fred would make a U-shaped metal bar with two handles on it at his place of work and bring it down to the cellar at 25 Cromwell and hook it up. And shortly after that would bring Anne down and tie her to this device and Rose and Fred would take turns torturing her for an entire day. And to add salt to the wound, literally, Rose would draw her a bath at the end of the day and she would pour hordes of salt in it so that Anne's open wounds would burn when she got into the bath. And all the crimes and horrendous acts we are going to talk about can't be covered completely. Can't, like, I, I can't go through all the details. This video would literally be like, 24 hours long. If I got into all the minute details that took place in that cellar, the amount of torture and abuse that went on in that house is exponential. It's insane. So I'm going to try to, you know, glaze over everything, just give you all the knowledge, but not go into every single detail because I honestly don't want to. So shortly after these incidents, Rose would give birth to her second child. And let me tell you, you're gonna lose track of how many kids pop out of this bitch. All right, there's a lot. But let's talk about the tenants that lived on 25 Cromwell. So for the most part, they were all young men, at least at the start. And for the most part, those young men were railing Rose. So it was quite literally a tacky corn video around every corner of this house and the kids would just be walking around. They'd either be in the room or in a different room when these, this was taking place. Rose would even walk around scantily clad to seduce the tenants on a regular basis. This house was essentially a brothel at this point with Rose being the only person that worked there. So since there was so much tomfoolery going on in this household, the West had to hire another nanny, a 17 year old named Caroline Owens, working for three pounds a week. Three pounds. I don't think that's a lot. I know it's a different time, but that doesn't seem like enough. And Caroline hated Fred, especially because, you know, he's a creepy piece of shit. So naturally, after only a few weeks of working for Fred and Rose, Caroline decided to get the hell out of Dodge. But Rose was mad because she hadn't gotten to have relations with her yet. Oh, and knowing that Caroline wouldn't want to be any part of that, Rose conducted a plan with Fred to kidnap her and grape her 
knowing full well the endeavor would almost certainly end in murder. So on December 6, 1972, Fred and Rose followed and confronted Caroline in their car, and they would convince her to get in. And Rose would try to make advances towards Caroline, but she would refuse. And after she refused, Fred would begin to beat her unconscious. And by the time Caroline woke up, she was being bound by her wrist and ankles and also getting brown packing tape wrapped around her head. And she could hear Rose laughing maniacally in the background. And you will find that this is a pattern as well. Rose took extreme pleasure in Fred doing these things to the girls and in Rose doing it to them herself. She was literally a sociopath. So Fred and Rose would take her back to 25 Cromwell and take her down to the cellar where she was bound and gagged for two days. After which Fred would come down and come to her crying and asking Caroline if she'd still wanna be their nanny. And Caroline obviously seeing a way out said yes and agreed to be their nanny. But only a couple weeks later when she found an out while they were walking to a local laundromat with the kids, she would sprint to her mom's house and tell her everything that happened. So after this, Caroline's parents would go to Rose and confront her about everything that Caroline told them. And Rose would just say, don't be f***ing daft. Who do you think I am? That's how she talked. Terrible. <laughs> but police would search their car and find tape and photos. And that was enough to arrest and detain them temporarily. So Rose and Fred would admit to just a little physical assault. And when it came time for Caroline to tell her side of the story to police and get it on record, she got nervous and scared and didn't want to relive the events, so she backed out, leaving Fred and Rose with minimal assault charges. With the police report saying about Fred, He's a docile sort who did not look like he could commit violence. What? You don't think this can commit violence? So at this point, Rose was pregnant with her third child and Fred had minimal past theft charges. So the police agreed to let them off with a 25 pound fine and they'd just be set free. Judicial system, you know? And this whole ordeal would just teach Fred and Rose that they could not leave any witnesses behind. So this is when they would start their killing spree. So it would be nine years until they would be in any sort of other police investigation looking into Rose and Fred West. And nine women would end up dead and buried at 25 Cromwell Street as a result. But the true number of victims is thought to be upwards of 30. But at this time, it was essentially, if there's no bodies, you can't be charged for it. So Linda Guff would be their first victim they killed together, from what we know. A 20-year-old that agreed to babysit their kids for them. But on April 19th, 1973, Linda would disappear. The only thing being left behind was a note for her mother saying that she got a flat on the way home and that she'd be back sometime in the future. This note obviously being written by Rose, which she did multiple times with multiple victims to keep them at bay so they wouldn't, uh, make a report of their children missing. But in reality, Linda was taken down to the cellar of 25 Cromwell, having her entire head wrapped tightly in packing tape and being given only a tiny tube to breathe through. That would be my worst goddamn nightmare. These people are just sick. Now, we don't know exactly how Linda died, whether it was during the sexual torture or just being killed on purpose at the end of them torturing her, but she would die and Fred would dismember and take his trophies as he always did. And then they would bury her beneath the garage at 25 Cromwell in what he called the inspection pit, where they could hide the pit with a car over top of it. A few weeks later, Linda's mother would come to the West asking where her daughter was. And Rose being the sadistic that she was had the audacity to answer the door wearing some of Linda's clothing that she was last seen in and also having some of Linda's clothing hanging up on the drying wire outside 25 Cromwell. But Rose would convince Linda's mother that she was beating Rose's kids so she kicked her out of the house and Linda's mother didn't ask any more questions and just left and never reported her missing. Meanwhile, Fred would continue to renovate and expand his torture room in the cellar, putting hooks in the ceiling to be able to dangle girls from 
and other various homemade torture devices being put in place. Fred's son Stephen would also later say that his father didn't only use the cellar to dismember bodies, they actually had a farm not too far out of the town that they lived in that he would take them to to dismember them. So Fred has a new and improved torture chamber and Rose is hungry for more victims at this point. So they set out to find them. Carol Ann Cooper and Lucy Parrington would be the next victims, being held in the cellar for seven whole days while being tortured and eventually murdered and dismembered as well like the other victims. And this is when Fred and Rose began to get into the groove and started to develop plans and patterns in their crimes. They found that it was easy to lure people in for sexual acts, but at the time they were mostly only doing that with men and not murdering them, but they didn't really want to deal with a threat like that, like a giant man, so they exclusively switched to only picking up girls. So as we know, some of the victims were familiar faces and some of them were complete strangers, often runaways and drifters. And one of those drifters was Therese Sigenteller. Sig Sigenteller? She was Swedish, so I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. But Therese was picked up while hitchhiking from London to Wales by Fred and Rose. And they would do what they always do and take her back to 25 Cromwell and put her down in the cellar. They would continue to torture and kill and dismember and bury her body beneath the garage as well. And the West would just continue to escalate through each murder. Seven months after Therese's death, they would pick up Shirley Hubbard at a bus stop and would take her back home into the cellar as well. They would tape her entire head with that brown packing tape as they did with previous victims and would shove that small tubing three inches inside her nasal cavity, giving her just barely enough air to breathe. And after she inevitably died of asphyxiation, Fred would cut her head off with the tape mask still on and would bury her body in the part of the cellar that had a shrine above it dedicated to Marilyn Monroe. Now, although Fred and Rose often took their victims from the streets, they would also take advantage of the tenants in their own home. Juanita Mott had been living at 25 Cromwell Street for almost two years at this point, which is crazy to think about, just knowing that all those people that have died just below her. But this was most likely because the rates at the West House were so cheap. I wonder why. If it's too cheap to believe, you're probably gonna get murdered. So on April 12th, 1974, Juanita would go into the cellar and never come out alive again. She would be one of the first to be strung up by the seven foot noose he had placed in the cellar and also be tied up in bondage knots. And she would be killed by a blow to the back of her head after hours and hours of torture, and then later buried under the house with the rest of the victims. And Fred would talk about these murders so callously in interviews after he got caught, saying that they asked for it or that the murders were never really planned and it was just something that happened. He was just full of shit from start to finish. Now, during all these murders, you're probably wondering why no one reported anybody missing. But that was because most of them were runaways. And at this time, nobody really reported those just because they just assumed that they lived somewhere else. If they were reported, Rose and Fred were easily and strategically able to talk their way out of it. So another victim of Fred and Rose was a 15 year old runaway that they snagged from a children's home, Jordan's Brook House. And she was only known as Miss A. And they would take her back to 25 Cromwell Street to live with them in the summer of 1976. And she would live with them for a very short period of time, but she would be made to have a horrific orgy consisting of the entire family, children, included. Rose would force her children to suck on Miss A's hair as Fred and Rose committed unspeakable acts to her. All while Rose was laughing maniacally as she always did during these events. And later on, her children would say how they actually had some fond memories with Fred as a father, albeit mostly horrible, but they did not recall one good memory of Rose as a mother. They said that she was always the one to carry out the abuse and the violence in the home for the most part. Now, Miss A was lucky enough to be allowed to leave, but she would later return with a full tank of gas in hand and a lighter ready to light up 25 Cromwell's. But she got too nervous to do it and she went back home. But she would later testify against Rose in the trials later in the future. So the Wests are still under no suspicion and they are regularly getting new tenants in the house, one of which was Shirley Ann Robinson. Now, Shirley would be a lot different 
different from the others. She actually had a relationship with Fred and Rose. They were kind of like a thruple, if you will. So at the start, this was a very consensual relationship. Rose and Shirley would even get pregnant at the same time together and be excited to raise the children together at some point. But this thruple situation would eventually fizzle out for reasons unknown, but most likely because Rose grew jealous and this was a pattern that happened as well and that we'll see in the future as well. So Rose gave birth to her child and shortly after decided that Shirley could no longer be around. So Rose herself would strangle Shirley, an eight month pregnant woman, and dispose of her like trash, just like the other girls. So after this murder in particular, Rose and Fred would take a break and just focus on the sexual work that Rose would do. And also having a couple more kids in the meantime, because you know, six or eight or however many they have right now wasn't enough. Please stop procreating you monsters. I still stand behind my statement that I think there should be a psych eval test for any people wanting to have children. But this downtime period wouldn't last because a trigger event would happen and that was the death of Rose's father, Bill Letts. He would die of mesothelioma. I don't know what that is, but here's the description. This would inevitably release the Kraken within Rose and she'd demand to go out hunting with Fred again for another victim. And unfortunately, Actually, that next victim would be Allison Chambers. She was another girl that came from Jordan's Brook House. This would be a house that they would often go to and prey on their victims just because they're helpless kids that don't have parents basically. So they were, they didn't have anywhere else to go. And they would hire Allison as a nanny for their children, just like they did with previous victims as well. But she would unfortunately meet the same fate as the other girls being tortured, beat and murdered and buried in their garden. The only difference with her disappearance is that it was actually reported. She had written a letter to Jacob's house saying that she got a job, but she would not specify where she got the job. So the trail ran cold, unfortunately, because she didn't mention that the job was at the West house. If she did, they may have gotten caught, but we'll never know. So by 1980, there was six kids living at 25 Cromwell. And after years and years of abuse by the hand of her own parents, Anne Marie escaped and left her family behind. But when she did that, Heather became the eldest in the house and inherently became the sole focus of her parents' abuse, replacing her sister Anne. After a while of being away though, Anne was forced to move back in with her parents at 25 Cromwell, but insisted that her boy friend be with her at all times so she wouldn't be exposed to her parents alone anymore. But this would leave Heather very vulnerable as well. And during this period, Rose would give birth to two more children somehow, most likely being sexual work babies and not Fred's children, which he didn't even really care about at this point. But Fred would say that he would only hurt and his children by blood because he said it was his birthright. Heather getting most of the treatment at this time though. And during this time too, and we're now in the 80s, it is assumed that Fred and Rose were killing many more girls. But since they didn't have proof and were never charged for it, we don't actually know. But given their lifestyle patterns and consistency of their past murders, it's basically a guarantee that they were continuing to murder and dispose of girls at the time. So naturally at this point, Heather West, Fred and Rose's daughter, was tired of being tortured day in and day out. And I mean, they tortured her. The there is like, I don't even know how many pages in about how she got afflicted with this torture. It is absolutely horrendous. But being extremely tired of it, she decided she needed to plan an escape from 25 Cromwell. And she would beg her older sister Anne to help, but Anne knew it was kind of a pointless venture given how her situation turned out with running away. So she didn't help Heather in doing that. So one day Heather decided that today was the day and she got up to leave the house, but wouldn't make it out of the house. Rose and Fred would say that they thought Heather might be a lesbian at the time and tried beating and graping her out of it and eventually strangling her to death. And they would say this in later interviews after they were arrested for all of the murders. It is thought though that Rose was the one to murder and dismember her because of how sloppy it was handled compared to Fred's victims remains from previous murders. And this was also thought because Rose was most likely jealous of Heather getting all of Fred's attention at the time as well, just like a few other murders that happened. So after Heather was murdered, she was stoned away under the steps of their back 
porch as they figured out how to get rid of her body at the time. Because at this point, they literally just ran out of room to bury bodies in, in and outside of their house. And this alludes to the idea that they murdered more girls. They were just burying them somewhere else because they had nowhere else to put them on the property. So the rest of the children would come home from school that day and obviously Heather had disappeared. So they were asking questions and the way they covered it up was saying that Heather got a job at a summer camp and wouldn't be back until the fall. So Fred would ask Stephen West, his son, to help him dig a hole in the backyard, not knowing that he was digging his own sister's grave. And after the hole was dug, Fred would dump her body in the hole and later build a patio over top of the grave, sealing her body beneath. Shortly after Heather's murder, though, Fred decided that he would put all of his remaining children in the cellar permanently, locking them behind an iron gate and never letting them out. And you would see the childlike graffiti on the walls and the odd drawings that the kids would do to just past the time being locked away in a cellar. It's just so incredibly sad to see and to hear. So Fred and Rose decided to make the first floor into a full-on brothel at this point, while their children were being kept away in the cellar at all times. And this would be the case for the next five years years. Now, during these years, it's not officially known if Fred and Rose actually murdered any more girls, but it was known that they regularly abused and graped many. And one of these girls in 1992 would tell her friends about what was happening to her uh, with Fred and Rose, and it would eventually reach the police. And Detective Hazel Savage would be put on the case. What a badass name. Now, Detective Savage didn't only have an insanely badass name, she was also just a badass. Being one of the first female detectives in England, and she was literally known as a super cop amongst all other cops and civilians. This woman is my goddamn hero. Now, Detective Savage had already actually had a run-in with Fred 30 years earlier. When Arena was arrested for petty theft, Rena had told Detective Savage about Fred and his violent f***ed up tendencies. And Detective Savage would remember this case 30 years later when his name came up again. This woman had the memory of a goddamn elephant. So sure enough, Savage looked into Fred's past offenses and she would find assault charges from back in 1973, warranting her the ability to start a case on the Wests. And before long, Fred and Rose West were arrested based on that one charge assault for the time being. But Detective Savage knew that there was probably far more going on behind closed doors, so the interviews and searches began. Savage would uncover the abuse of Anne Marie, as well as the disappearances of Charmaine and Heather, warranting further investigation. Rumors also arose about what might be buried under the patio, which we know was Heather. The younger West children were taken into care and Rose tried to take the easy way out at the time and attempted suicide, but was unsuccessful because her son, Stephen, found her and revived her. The case against the West collapsed when two key witnesses, though, decided not to testify against them. Savage would continue to pursue her or Heather, questioning the West children repeatedly. But they had been extremely well trained by their parents and failed to cooperate because they had been being brainwashed their entire lives. Five years of their lives, they were locked away in a cellar, for God's sake. But in February 1994, a warrant was obtained to search the Cromwell property and the garden. Police would find the remains of two dismembered and decapitated women, one of which they assumed was Shirley Robinson. Red West would claim sole responsibility for these murders, and when Rose heard of the confession, she denied all knowledge of Heather's death, which we know is complete. Bushlaka. Then inexplicably, Fred admitted the presence of the body in the cellar to the police. This guy, he loved to talk in these interviews. He would just like talk, 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 talk. There is uh, plenty of tapes of him speaking, which I will probably input. I said, you bitch, because I'd already, I, whenever she said that, I realized that I, I, I thought, me, she killed her and had her clothes on. She's wearing the girl's shoes and she killed her for sake. And her dressing gown. Mm -hmm. I mean, how f can you go? Mm -hmm. You know, I said, you wore a 
Goat after your goater. And in the cellar, they would discover the remains of nine individuals. Establishing the identities of each victim was a huge task, to say the least. And continuing to cooperate, Fred revealed the location of the remains of his first wife, Rena, lover Anna McFall, and daughter Charmaine, who were all buried away from the Cromwell Street house. And as the case against them would develop, Rose tried increasingly to distance herself from Fred, claiming she was also a victim. But police were not convinced, thankfully, given the sheer number of murders which had occurred and her participation in the grapes. So on December 13th, 1994, Fred West was charged with 12 counts of murder and taken into custody at Winston Green Prison in Birmingham, where on January 1st, 1995, he unfortunately took the easy way out or not fortunately, I don't really know. And he hung himself in his cell via bed sheets. And this was predicated on the fact that Rose had distanced herself so much from him, not responding to his letters from jail, of which he said things like, As in life, as in earth, our love will never die. Rose and I will live together in heaven. I will wait for you, darling, so please come to me. Gross. Who's gonna tell him he's going to hell? And don't worry about it, she's got a VIP pass down there, so she'll meet you there. But anyway, he felt rejected enough to take his own life, basically. His devotion to his wife, Rose, was most apparent in the paperwork found in the prison cell following his slewer slide. He had even drawn a gravestone for himself and his wife, Rose, along with the words saying, In loving memory, Fred West, Road West, Rest in peace where no shadow falls. In perfect peace, he waits for Rose, his wife. And rather than Rose thinking that was a sweet gesture done by the love of her life, she just saw it as a get out of jail free card, trying to use his death as a means of making him more guilty than her. But luckily, it didn't work. Rose West went to trial on October 3rd, 1995, and witnesses, including her stepdaughter Anne Marie, testified to her participation in the sexual assaults on young women. Her defense counsel tried to argue that evidence of assault was not evidence of a murder, but when Rose testified on her own behalf, her violent nature and dishonesty became clear to the jury, and they saw right through her lies. And they unanimously and thankfully found her guilty on 10 separate counts of murder on November 22nd, 1995. She received a life sentence having to serve a minimum of 25 years in jail. Rose West's sentence was later extended to a whole life order sentence by the Home Secretary, effectively removing any possibility of parole, thank God. And Rose West uh, refused to accept her fate and launched an appeal in 1996 and in 2000, claiming variously that new evidence clearing her had come to light, and then that huge media interest had prevented her from receiving a fair trial at the time. The 1996 appeal was rejected and she dropped the later one. So she remains incarcerated to this day. And the West home on 25 Cromwell Street, or the House of Horrors, as in dubbed by the media, was torn down to the ground October 1996. In its place now is a pathway that leads to the town center now. So, holy shit. That was a really long one. Um, I appreciate if you stuck to the stuck here, stick around. I can't even speak now. I appreciate if you stuck around to the end. I I had, you know, a time and a half researching this, but like I always say, I, I enjoy doing these videos. So if you have any suggestions, uh, let me know down below for the next true crime episode. But in the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful night, wonderful day, wonderful afternoon, wherever you are. And I will see your beautiful face in the next video. All right. Bye.